Greetings, Eric Backer from New Zealand. Back again, we're talking about irritable bowel syndrome. This time we're talking about the causes of IBS. So the way I see it, I'm just going to read some stuff I've got in my other computer above here um, on the four main causes of IBS, the way I see it. Infections, especially uh, you know if you've had a SIBO or a candida problem, can be a real a big issue. Number two, lactose intolerance. Number three, food allergies and food intolerances. And number four, stress. So let's have a look at those four things because those are four huge areas. Um, the four big reasons why people get irritable bowel syndrome. Now, I also wrote in my book that um, if you go to a doctor, there's a big chance that you may be diagnosed with NAD or no abnormal diagnosis and being sent away with Metamucil or some kind of bulking agent or something like that. Now that's okay, it may work for some, but if you keep getting this problem coming back, you better darn well find out what the cause is because you don't want to have this problem for a long period of time. Most of my IBS patients know all the lavatories in town. They know where all the toilets are, all the restrooms. A lot of these people don't even like going out in the morning for shopping or, or running errands or doing things like that. This can really mess up your life, this problem. I mean, one of the worst things you can have is to have a bowel that's not functioning optimally. So it's imperative that you find out what the cause is. Causes uh, addressed make a lot more sense than just treatments. <coughs> Why would you want to shoot in the dark at something? You're better off putting the spotlight on it and then just, you know, getting it in your scope and shooting it and taking it out with one hit because you've identified your target. So it's very important that you understand the causes need to be uh, sorted out. And for each person, those causes may be individual. There's no such thing as one cause, you know, um, fits the boat for everybody. Just like saying that everybody needs to wear a red jacket or black shoes, you know, what a load of crap. Everybody will want to wear different kind of clothes. What do you think of my groovy shirt this morning? Tracy doesn't like this shirt. She thinks it looks a bit crappy on me, but I quite like it. But she's away today, so I can wear what I want. Yay. So, as I mentioned, the four main areas I look at, okay, infections, lactose, food allergies and food intolerances, and stress. Well, what they found through research is nearly 80% of people with irritable bowel syndrome have had SIBO, have SIBO, or have had SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, 80%. About 25 to 30% of people with irritable bowel syndrome have candida or had a candida infection. So there's a big chance someone with IBS had some kind of a gut problem. So remember we talked about infections, yeast, bacteria, parasites. So you can have candida, which many people have in the bowel, not presenting a problem because it's in balance. We've got hundreds of species of bacteria in our gut, and these are kept in check by other bacteria, particularly beneficial bacteria. But when the balance goes out through antibiotics or stress or for one more reason, this is when an infection can happen or an overgrowth. Now, up to 18 to 20% of people with IBS have got a parasite problem, okay? That's nearly like one in five have got a parasite. I can tell you from over a thousand stool tests I've done that many, many people I see with IBS have got a yeast infection, will have a bacterial problem or a parasite problem. And when we do the stool test, we get the results back, bingo, we found the cause, okay? Now, we address that immediately, and in often cases, there's a big resolution of the symptoms. Maybe not a complete disappearance, because it takes some time for the bowel really to come back into its own. So if you've had a problem higher up in the small intestine, or you may have had a helicobacter infection of the stomach, you may have taken a medication, a drug for that, you know, triple therapy or antibiotics. You may have also taken a drug like rifaximin for SIBO. Now in about 40 to 50% of cases that will work, but I can't tell you how many hundreds of patients I've seen that have been through a rifaximin treatment <clears throat> or a different antibiotic treatment. It initially worked, but then it came back again. It's like the alcoholic. I'm not drinking anymore. I swear I won't drink. And they stop. And then they start again. Okay. So infections are often like a recovering alcoholic. Okay. They will lie to you. They will tell you they're not going to do it again. But then they come back and haunt you again and again. Okay. So just be careful. When promises are made for you that if you take an antibiotic, that you will conquer this thing. You will kill it. It will not come back. I can tell you a lot of people fall for this line and it comes back. Okay. The only way you're going to get on top of an infection and nail it permanently is by first understanding what led you into that problem in the first place. 
that's A. B, effective treatment to eradicate and get things in balance. And C, the most important one, is to maintain a good lifestyle and diet for a long enough period of time which stops a recurrence. Okay, that's the intelligent approach. The dumb approach is just to take a drug and then to go back out there again and drink all your beers and have all your crappy foods and then have crappy relationships with people and, and, and not sleep and be on Facebook all the time liking people and stuff like that. So when you're leading imbalanced lifestyles, you cannot get that gut back again. Okay. So the causes. Remember, we talked about the infections. We talked about SIBO. But what about lactose? Now, lactose is a big problem with a lot of people. If you've got a lactose problem, you've got diarrhea, generally diarrhea. Okay. You can get constipation from lactose, but usually you'll be farting, uh, bloating, uh, and loose stools. That's the, the clear one with lactose. Now, I can't really tolerate uh, cow's milk at all. I like a little bit of cow's milk when I have porridge in the morning. I've, I've had a habit for a while of putting like raw milk onto my porridge, you know, creamy raw milk, but then I'm sniffing and <clears throat> clearing my throat. In some of my videos, you may have heard me sniffing or clearing my throat. Um, that's particularly so if I've had porridge that morning and I've had some raw milk. So I'm one of those people who can't tolerate milk. So I don't have any milk anymore in my, my life. I've just kicked it kicked it out completely. So hopefully it'll be the end of my sniffing and throat clearing. So be careful of lactose. And if you've got IBS, especially diarrhea and bloating, stop any dairy products for a while and see if that could be the cause. Okay, simple. Just stop. Stop for about two months and see what happens to your gut. And that includes cheeses. That includes... Uh, all kinds of milks, just be careful, particularly cow's milk. I wouldn't go as far as to say stop goat's milk. Butter is always fine. I don't find butter a problem. I've never seen a butter allergy, but I've seen plenty of dairy allergies. Okay, So that's the primary one I want you to think about is lactose when it comes to you know um, IBS for many people, especially Asian people, uh, fair-skinned people. There'll be a lot of people who can't really tolerate lactose. They may be drinking milk now and not even understanding the link between that and you know their diarrhea. Third one, food allergies and food intolerances. People who've had SIBO for a while uh, often develop leaky gut. People who drink alcohol, you know, there are many reasons why you could get leaky gut. Leaky gut often leads to uh, a big problem with uh, tolerating foods. Many people get uh, issues with their pancreas. You might see my little microscopy thingy here in the corner, wonder what the hell that is. And um, I've been looking at eyes now for nearly 30 years, so I do iridology. And one of the interesting things um, I find with many people is pancreatic dysfunction. It's one of the glands that often shows up in the eye. The kidneys show up, the pancreas shows up. I had a very interesting case a few days ago of a lady, and I looked at the eyes, and she was 63, and I said, something doesn't add up here. I can't see kidney function showing up. I can't see pancreas showing up. It's almost like, you know... You're in your 20s or 30s. What's happened? And she said, well, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I don't drink any coffee or tea. I have no alcohol. I eat an extremely clean diet, and I only drink water and occasionally herbal teas. And you could see it in the eye. That kind of lifestyle had paid off. You know. So cause and effect. Food allergies, food intolerances. Check out my videos on those because you can see a lot of information I've already done on that. Um, stress. Stress accounts um, for, in my opinion, about 25 up to 30 percent of IBS. Did it initially cause IBS? No. I believe that it came along. There was a trigger. The person had a dysfunctional lifestyle for a while with their gut, and and because of they were stressed often, stress comes along and it just keeps the bowel in a dysfunctional state. When you've got IBS really bad, like some of my patients have, it's almost like living as like a person who's got cancer on chemotherapy, okay? Your quality of life is not really there. You become asocial. You don't like going out eating. You need to learn, uh, you know, I wonder if there's a Google app where you can find all the toilets in town because that would be a good one for, that might be a good business idea for me to make an irritable bowel syndrome app for people where all the dunnies are, all the toilets. So the point I'm making is when you've got stress, you get autonomic dysfunction. I will have completed some videos on this topic already, no doubt. So stress plays a massive role in initiating the problem, you know, to get out of hand and to maintain it, to keep it in a bad position. So uh, particularly if you've got a thyroid or adrenal uh, problem as well, and you're a nervous person, 
uh, or irritated person, you have insomnia, you have mood issues or cognitive dysfunction, if you've got those kinds of patterns and you've got irritable bowel syndrome, you don't just want to target the gut. You want to target really um, other causes that are higher up, which is going to really help the bowel uh, come back you know, into its own you know, good form again. There's a huge link between the bowel and cognition. And many, many people I see with, for example, um, a brain fog or, or can't think with clarity have got a bowel problem. I've seen this quite a lot. So get your, get your um, st comprehensive stool analysis completed. I can't stress that enough. If you want to really understand the cause of IBS, uh, one of the first things I recommend you do is a comprehensive stool analysis, in, um, including parasitology, three samples. Get that done. You know, it's going to cost you a couple of hundred dollars, but you'll have some answers. You'll at least be able to eliminate that line of inquiry or say, hang on, what have I got here? I've got blastocystis. What the hell's that? Some kind of a weird food or something. Or what kind of bug is this? Or so establish the cause and then think about the treatment. All right. Think about that. Now, the next video we're going to do in this series will be signs and symptoms of IBS. So catch up with me in the next video. Click on the link down below if you haven't already got my free uh, Candida report. Thanks for tuning in.